Well, so we will proceed. And now we'll, we'll start uh, looking at the different stages that are involved in developing a digital business solution. And usually the stages are divided into four uh, uh, main uh, steps. And these are, will be discussed in turn. And today we will mostly focus on the uh, first one, and, and that is uh, feasibility analysis, project planning, change in risk uh, management. Uh, but also, we will talk a little bit about uh, prototyping. But in the uh, last two chapters, we will have a much more detailed uh, discussion of the, the other three stages that are involved in a, uh, implementing digital business uh, solutions. So typically, when, when you're implementing a digital business solution, there is an uh, initiation stage, and that is uh, uh, the first one, and then prototyping, and then for, that will be followed by implementation, and finally, maintenance of the, of, of the system. So today, mostly, we will focus on the, on, on the first stage. And these stages are actually based on a typical system development stage that engineers use quite a lot. So the stages that we also use uh, in digital business uh, solution implementation is also based on this, except that there are some slight changes that you need to consider. There are some differences between a typical system development cycle and uh, a cycle that is involved in digital uh, business solution implementation. And these changes are first, the time scale. In case of uh, digital business solution implementation, the time scale is much shorter. And that is because of the kind of uh, business environment uh, digital uh, enterprises are operating in, that things are changing so fast, which means you cannot use so long time to implement uh, uh, new changes. Things, you, you have to be very fast, which means your uh, business uh, uh, solution implementation has to be fast. And that is what we call uh, compressed uh, time scales. And then another aspect that you need to consider is uh, the new system does not necessarily need to reside within your organization. It, may, it might be uh, hosted by external service uh, providers, as we discussed when we talked about digital uh, enterprises uh, uh, technologies. So you have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, internet service providers and other uh, third part uh, service providers that can provide uh, applications or solutions to your organization such that you don't need to keep all the systems within uh, your organization. So that's uh, a, a difference from uh, a, a typical uh, system uh, that follows uh, system development uh, life cycle. And then another difference is the focus uh, of the project is on content and services rather than uh, on application, which means that in order to develop uh, di digital business solutions, it's very important that we accumulate, uh, deliver uh, uh, information as effectively as possible. And this is a key. E acquisition and deliver, deliverance of information is at the core of implementing digital business solutions. And then uh, uh, another thing that you need to consider is uh, because most of these systems are connected to the internet, then issue of uh, speed and availability as well as security becomes of uh, prime concern as opposed to traditional uh, business uh, systems that are kept within an organization and are not connected or are not part of the larger networks that could be accessed by other people or by outsiders of your uh, organization. And then you need to consider about uh, analysis uh, uh, and design, and this is uh, a key aspect of digital business uh, solutions. And another difference, and that is uh, the last one, is such systems are very dynamic. That is, whenever you introduce a new system, in the context of digital uh, business, 
that's not the end of it. You, you always, there are changes in the uh, environment and you need to, to adapt to these changes, which means whatever system that you are introducing in your organization has to be dynamic in the sense that it has to be updated from time to time to adapt to the changes that happen in an organization. So uh, those are the main differences between uh, uh, a digital uh, business solution or a, a system from a traditional uh, system. Now we will talk about uh, uh, prototyping. So we have discussed about introducing new digital uh, solutions uh, to organizations, proposing new systems, but not everyone uh, within an organization will have a clear understanding of what we are proposing, which means we need to demonstrate of the new uh, suggestions that we are, we, are, we are giving. And that's what we call uh, prototyping. A, a prototyping is creation of uh, a demo of a new system that we are proposing. So it's a creation of a, a model or a sample of either a product or a process or whatever solution that you are proposing. Because as a project manager, you will be responsible, among other things, to selling this idea of introducing new changes into the organization. So in order for people to accept uh, these changes, you have to create a, a simple demonstration uh, of this proposed system. And that's what we call uh, prototyping. And that will help you uh, as a means of explaining uh, to, to, to uh, various members of, a, of an organization of why is it necessary for, for the organization to, to embrace this new change or this new uh, solution. Now, there are a number of uh, stages that are involved in prototyping. The first one is, uh, first you need to identify uh, the user requirements. That is, in order to create a, a demo for a new proposed uh, system, you, you have to identify which requirements are necessary to be uh, included in, in the new uh, process. That the people that eventually will use this process have to be consulted uh, to provide information of, of their requirements. And your prototype has to include all these requirements because when you are demonstrating uh, to these people how the proposed system will work, you are likely to be questioned about the various functionalities that they are expecting your system to, to serve them. So you have to identify the requirements of, of all the users that are likely to uh, interact with this uh, new proposed system. And then after identifying all the requirements, you have to move uh, rapidly to developing a, a, a prototype. So you have to be very fast in uh, developing a prototype, and this comes uh, from what we discussed earlier, that we are operating in a rapidly changing environment, which means things have to be fast. Digital uh, business solutions have to be developed fast, and that's one of the difference between uh, these new uh, technological solutions and traditional uh, systems. So it has to start with a prototype. You have to develop uh, a prototype as fast as possible, get feedback from people uh, you have so that you can show uh, the, the users of, of what they should expect from the proposed uh, system. And then you have to iterate and produce further requirements. Now the way a prototype is developed is through a sequence of, uh, 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 of improvements that from time to time you develop a, a, a prototype, you develop a model, give it to the users and get feedback from them. So instead of uh, build, spending resources and uh, time to build a, a complex uh, prototype only to ask uh, uh, users and get negative feedback from them, you are advised that you create uh, slight improvements, show it to the, to the users, and if they are satisfied uh, with the prototype, you can move on to the next stage. But don't do too much at, at a time. So it has to, take it, to be taken into small steps in terms of uh, improvement, uh, slight improvement from time uh, to time. And then if they, uh, the model is accepted, develop uh, module uh, prototypes. These are individual applications that will save to accomplish a particular process. So 
after developing a prototype for the entire process, now you go further into the details, and that is developing module prototypes, individual applications within a process. If that is also uh, accepted, then you can throw away the prototype and develop a more robust vision. So after receiving feedback uh, from your uh, users and they are well satisfied with what you have demonstrated to them, you have demonstrated to them, then you can develop a, a full function uh, system. So it always starts with the users. That you have to obtain input from the users and use that input to develop a prototype, that a model of how the process uh, will look like. You send it back to the users, they provide you with uh, feedback, you improve it, send it back again until when uh, a process is uh, accepted. So engineers know this very much, that always prototype, always prototype. Whenever you are designing something, remember to prototype because we don't want to spend resources only to find out uh, in the end we have wasted our resources simply because whatever we have created doesn't work or doesn't produce the desired uh, results. And this is similar to implementation of uh, digital uh, businesses. That is, we always have to prototype the new solutions that we are suggesting in the organization. Now there are characteristics of uh, prototypes that we need to consider. That how do we uh, prototype and how should our prototypes look like? Now the first uh, characteristic is rapidness. That is uh, the prototype that we are creating has to be uh, rapid, that is we have to be fast. And this is a, a direct uh, a reflection of what kind of environment we are uh, operating in. So create uh, a prototype Send it back. To, send it to the users. Get feedback. Move on fast uh, to improve the uh, the prototype. Get feedback again, and so on. So, be fast. And then the prototype has to be simple because we are using this prototype to explain uh, to users that are probably lack technical knowledge of what we are trying to introduce to the organization. So, make sure that. The prototype is as simple as possible. The most important thing is it provides uh, an indication or it provides a picture of how the solution you are proposing will look like, how it will uh, function. And then a, a prototype is uh, uh, iterative in the sense that it's characterized by a sequence of improvements. So it's an ongoing uh, process where each time uh, users are, are, are consulted for, for their feedback in order to uh, make improvement on the, on the prototype. And then the prototype is uh, incremental in the sense that each version of the application has a limited number of uh, new features. So incremental in the, in the sense that the changes that you are making to a prototype uh, have to be uh, slight or have to be bit by bit, that every time you make a slight changes and ask for feedback, rather than making radical, uh, huge uh, changes before asking for, for, for feedback. And finally, a prototype, uh, prototyping has to be user-centered. So always remember that you are creating a system that has a final, uh, end users, and these users have to be consulted or have, have to be involved uh, in the process of uh, prototyping because we want to create a system that eventually will be usable within an organization. And that is possible if we put users at the center of uh, prototyping process. Now, the concept of prototyping, uh, that is creation of uh, sample models that has been now extended to what is called agile software uh, development. And that is uh, a much, uh, even a, a much more rapid uh, approach uh, to creation of, of, uh, of software. And we, this uh, system has been increasingly uh, embraced because it produces uh, desired results much faster than uh, the, the traditional uh, approach. And the core principles around agile software development are first emphasis on uh, individuals and 
interactions rather than processes and tools. So in this case, individuals that are going to use uh, the, the solutions, uh, whether it's a software or, uh, or a platform that we are developing, are much more valid. We, we know that the inputs from, from these uh, users are much more important, and that's what is emphasized. Of course, there is a recognition of the importance of processes and tools, but uh, in this case, we focus on individuals and interactions. And then another focus is on working software. Instead of uh, focusing on documenting on user requirements and other things uh, that are necessary or related to the uh, proposed solution, this approach focuses on, focuses on developing uh, a working software, a working product. So we want to quickly translate whatever we have in our uh, ideas into a functioning uh, uh, product. So usually the uh, products that are created as a result of uh, agile software development are full functioning uh, software in themselves. So they can be regarded as main software. So a complete product is developed and then users can be uh, consulted uh, for feedback regarding uh, what has been uh, fully uh, developed. And then there is much more involvement of uh, Customer, uh, 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 customer collaboration. That is, customers, the people that eventually will benefit from these solutions are much more uh, involved when it comes to agile software development. And that is because whenever these are involved in each stage that is forward, we are sure that at the end, we will have a, a product that it has been approved all the way uh, by intended uh, customers. And then finally, this uh, approach emphasizes on responding to, to, to changes. That is, in, instead of being uh, rigid to a, a plan that we, we decided uh, earlier, with this approach, uh, the project uh, uh, team will be uh, responsive to the changes that are likely to, to affect uh, the implementation of the, uh, of the solutions that is created. Now we will come back and discuss a little bit about uh, uh, human resources requirements. I, I hinted in the beginning that one of the challenges that organizations that want to adopt digital technology face is acquiring uh, employees with the right skills, uh, talents, and competencies. And this is uh, for the obvious uh, reason that many organizations are looking for such uh, people, for people with uh, such skills, uh, experience, and competences. Which means for an organization uh, that does not have uh, enough resources to, uh, to acquire uh, competent em employees, it can be quite uh, challenging. And in fact, the challenge of uh, acquiring the, the right uh, skills is faced not only by small organizations, but even large organizations. They, they all face the same because generally the supply for employees uh, with, with such uh, skills and talents uh, is low compared to, uh, to, to demand, which means organizations have to be uh, well prepared for attracting uh, the right uh, uh, employees, but also for employ uh, retaining uh, the employees that uh, we, we acquire. Because we know that always these employees will be tempted by, by even uh, better offers that are available in the, in the market. Especially uh, large companies are offering huge salaries and working other working benefits that can easily attract uh, employees from small organizations. It's a big challenge to retain uh, such employees, but we have uh, a framework that can help you, uh, us uh, in uh, providing good experience uh, to our employees. Because one of the challenges that uh, uh, employees in technology uh, companies uh, usually state when they, they quit from an organization is being bored with the kind of task uh, that uh, uh, they, they are performing. That is, they reach a point 
they feel that they are not learning anymore uh, by working in a particular organization. So this is the framework that can help you, uh, uh, among other things, to increase the motivation of your employees to work in your organization. So the first uh, three aspects that you need to, to consider is uh, skill variety. According to research, usually employees uh, get uh, more to work with an, uh, an organization when they are given tasks that do not require a variety of uh, skills. So if they are performing uh, tasks that require them to use the same uh, skill sets over and over again, then the task becomes uh, re repetitive and monotonous, and you can easily become bored. So most employees in technology companies prefer dynamic environment where they can use different uh, skill sets. So you are encouraged that uh, give them tasks that will require them to use different types of uh, uh, skills. And then uh, provide them with the uh, task uh, identity. That is, make it possible uh, for uh, employees uh, to identify themselves with a, uh, with a particular uh, task, and that goes hand in hand with task significance. The, the task that you are giving to your employees have to have meaning in the organization, have to contribute to, the, to value uh, within an organization. And that will make someone feel good, because when you are doing uh, something that you know uh, contributes to the value in your organization, it gives you, uh, you know, it makes you feel proud of yourself because uh, that makes you feel that you are productive, you are useful within that organization. So according to research, if you manage uh, to do those three uh, uh, aspects, that will help your uh, organization, uh, your employees uh, realize the meaningfulness of, of the work they are doing. And it's a way of motivating your uh, employees. But another thing that you need to consider is uh, autonomy. That is, make your employees independent. That they need to feel the, the freedom in what they are doing as opposed to supervising, like close supervision in whatever uh, they are doing. So it's very important in uh, technology uh, companies, uh, digital technology intensive companies, for employees to feel autonomy. And that's why you have uh, some larger uh, companies where they allow the employees even to work from home. So all that you, you are assessed uh, with is the, the performance, the, the results that your, uh, your, your seniors have said for you. So by giving people uh, freedom, autonomy, it's a way of uh, uh, motivating them. And then another factor that you can consider is uh, feedback, giving feedback to your employees in whatever uh, they, they are doing that will help them to uh, accumulate uh, knowledge and know whether what they are doing is right or wrong. And if we manage to do all this, then research suggests that your employees will have high internal work motivation. They will be uh, very satisfied, will have a high general job satisfaction, and they will be effective in whatever they are doing. Now sometimes organizations do not have all the skills uh, to perform the certain uh, activities within uh, the organization. Or in case of digital business uh, transformation, sometimes we do not have all the talents or all the skill sets, all the competences that are necessary to implement uh, digital business uh, solutions. And as I said, it can be, it, difficult, and not it case, but it's quite difficult to, to acquire employees with all these skills that we need. In that case, you may consider outsourcing, and that is approaching uh, other organizations that have uh, the relevant uh, skills that you are looking for so that you can implement uh, your uh, business, uh, your digital business transformation with the help from this uh, uh, organization. But of course, Outsourcing to is not that easy. There are a couple of uh, questions that you need to, 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 to resolve when it comes to finding the right partner where you can outsource your uh, 
organization. And there are two uh, patterns of uh, appro uh, outsourcing that organizations uh, use. The first one is uh, outside E, whereby an organization uh, right away recognizes that it lacks the skills and uh, the, the competence uh, to implement certain solutions in, that, in, the, in, its own, uh, in its own, and therefore they decide to outsource this uh, 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 activity right away. But after some time, when they have developed the competence themselves, they move in that uh, uh, activity inside their organization. And that's the essence of outside in. So uh, you first out, out, outsource, and after developing the competence yourself, you move it inside. But another approach is inside out. And that is uh, initially uh, you implement the solutions yourself. But over time, as they grow bigger and become much complex, you realize that you cannot handle it yourself. Then you can opt uh, to outsource uh, the activity. That is, you can approach uh, a, a, a supplier or a third party that can help you undertake uh, that activity. And outsourcing is quite useful because it allows you to focus on your uh, core business uh, activities instead of uh, uh, spreading your focus on all, all of uh, your organization. You, focus on the core activities and other companies can do some other activities uh, for you. Now, the question is, how do you outsource? Do you outsource all the activities from a particular organization? Or do you choose different organizations with different competencies to provide service, uh, to provide you with different activities within uh, your that you would like to outsource. So this is an example uh, of a business to customer company that wants to outsource uh, various sell side digital business activities and the various options that they, they can have when it comes to outsourcing. So here you have uh, different activities on the left hand side, and these are different companies that you may consider for. Outsourcing. So in case of uh, strategy, for instance, you, you know that you lack uh, competence with uh, strategy formulation and, and the implementation, then you can find a management consulting firm uh, to help you uh, with that. If you lack competence with uh, design of your sales side uh, e-commerce, then you can consult uh, a new media agents that can do it on your behalf. Right. Likewise, if you have a little competence in content and service development, new media agents can also help you uh, do that. And likewise, uh, online promotion, such as uh, these uh, new media agents can also do the same because these are newly uh, established uh, uh, companies that are saving companies with them. Uh, modern uh, challenges that are brought by digital uh, technologies. But you may also want to promote your uh, business offline. And for that case, you can consult a traditional uh, marketing address. And finally, if you, you lack uh, infrastructure, you don't necessarily need to buy everything uh, and have it in-house. You can outsource uh, infrastructure from uh, internet service provider or a traditional IT supplier. So you have all the options and the, these choices are made based on cost benefit analysis. Uh, the cost for having uh, a particular solution inside the organization versus outsourcing. Likewise, the cost of having uh, all the, uh, uh, the activities uh, provided by one organization or using different organizations uh, to provide different activities uh, for your organization. Uh, we, are, we will also look at uh, different approaches that are used when it comes to uh, implementation of uh, change. And we have four main uh, approaches to to change, that whenever we are implementing uh, changes, these are the 
types of approaches that we, we can use. The first one is a collaborative approach, and that is a, a type of approach where everyone within an organization is uh, involved. You are consulting everyone, and everyone provides inputs to how the change uh, should be like, how the digital uh, uh, transformation should be carried out. But another approach is consultative, whereby the management of the organization takes the decision that now we are going to uh, implement a particular uh, digital solutions, but their decision is based on input from uh, employees of the organization. Another approach is uh, directive, where the management again takes uh, decision, but in this case, the employees trust that the management will, will do the right thing. So the employees are informed about the changes that are about to happen, but it's mostly the management team that uh, takes the, the decision. And the last approach is coercive. And by coercive, uh, it means that the employees are not in involved, or if they're involved, then it's to a very limited extent. But the management uh, team takes all the decisions by themselves. Now, research uh, indicates that usually consultative uh, approach is the most common approach. That is, you have a management uh, team that is responsible for making decision, but this decision has to involve consultation uh, of employees. Now we have a, a, a model uh, for achieving change that in order, uh, how do we implement uh, the, the change? And this is a, a classical uh, model that is used by uh, in literature uh, to demonstrate how change can be uh, implemented. It's comprised of uh, three stages, and the first stage is unfreeze. By unfreezing it, it means that uh, before introducing a change, usually the, there is a, a way that we are doing business. So before introducing change, we need to change the mindsets uh, of employees and prepare them for the change that is uh, about to come. And this can be done by, say, training, provide uh, uh, education, uh, workshop seminars as a way of preparing employees for uh, changes that are to come. And then the next stage is implementing uh, the change. So this has to be done very, very fast. Uh, as soon as uh, all the employees have been uh, informed about the changes that are about to come, then the change is uh, implemented. And finally, we have to ensure that the change becomes permanent. And that, that is, we have to ensure the stability of, of the change because we introduced this change with a, a particular intended goals. And for these goals to be realized, the change that has been introduced has to be uh, stable. So that is uh, uh, this third step uh, in this uh, model for achieving uh, change. Now, in order uh, to, to ensure that employees are ready and, uh, for change and will, be, uh, will embrace the change, there are a couple of individuals that you need to, to, to identify. First, you need to identify system sponsors. System sponsors are senior managers uh, or members of uh, board of directors. So these are individuals that are, have a, a decision-making power within an organization. And once they have embraced change, then it's easier to convince other employees within an organization uh, to embrace the change. But also you have system owners. These are uh, managers that are responsible for the various processes that are, we are planning uh, to change. So it could be uh, a marketing manager, a procurement manager, uh, whoever that is uh, owns a particular process that will be uh, transformed. So we need to convince uh, these people in advance. And then you have system uh, users. And this could be, say, in case of a, a, of a proposed new procurement system, system users could be uh, the various buying uh, units within an organization, the, the departments that are, uh, are will use the system uh, to buy their requisitions. But besides that, we also need to, to identify uh, another category of individuals, and that is uh, 
first uh, uh, the, the various uh, stakeholders, and these are uh, the, the individuals that will interact uh, with uh, the, the system. And then you have to uh, identify uh, legitimizers, and these are people that are regarded as quite experienced and uh, respected within an organization. So you, you, you need to win the support of such individuals in order uh, to convince everyone else in an organization uh, to adapt the change. And also you need to identify opinion leaders. Opinion leaders are people that usually do not have formal power within an organization, but they are quite influential. Organizations are, in a way, kind of political systems. You, you have people that are quite influential, that people uh, listen to them so much. So you want first to convince uh, these people, because once they accept the change, then it's likely that they will influence uh, other employees within an organization. Another aspect that we need to uh, look at is uh, organizational uh, culture, and that represents uh, the shared values and written rules and assumptions within an organization, as well as practices that uh, all individuals within an organization uh, share. So organizational culture can be uh, regarded as a human, uh, behavior of humans within an organization and the meaning that uh, people attach to those behaviors. Usually these are not written, these are kind of uh, codes, uh, norms, values that exist within an organization as a way of doing things that has to be considered. And when it comes to introduction of uh, new digital solutions. As I said earlier, when you introduce uh, new digital te te technologies, most like organizational cultures uh, will change. And therefore, we have to, uh, to, to pay uh, attention to that. Now, there are different uh, types of cultural orientation that you, you, you need to consider. The first one is, uh, survival orientation or outward uh, looking. And in this case, such organizations are very much influenced by external uh, changes. So whenever uh, changes happen in the external environment, then these organizations will tend uh, to uh, respond to such uh, changes. And this is a typical culture of most small uh, organizations. So in this case, there are no structured or fixed uh, structure within an organization which allows it to respond quickly to the changes that happen uh, in the uh, environment. Another approach is uh, productivity uh, uh, orientation, which is similar to the first one in the sense that it is outward uh, looking, except that in this case, there is a, a structured interface between the organization and the external environment. So for instance, there could be uh, structured links between uh, the organization and its suppliers or customers in the form of extranets. And this uh, allow uh, the company both to, to respond uh, to the changes in a systematic way. But the difference is the first one is much faster because due to a presence of the uh, uh, established structures such as hierarchy in decision making, organizations where with such approach tend to be much slower. And this is a typical characteristics of some medium to large uh, sized uh, organizations. And then you have uh, human relations uh, uh, orientation, which is a inward looking uh, system where organization uh, is like a family, that they are, you have uh, interpersonal relations and the decisions and activities are mostly based on uh, these relations within uh, an organization. So rather than having rigid uh, hierarchical structures of decision making uh, across uh, functional areas, the activities are, are mostly done based on interpersonal uh, relations. And uh, the last one is stability orientation, which is also inward looking, but the difference uh, between stability orientation and human re relations is this is much more uh, structured and rigid. So the external environment is completely ignored. The, the processes are 
based uh, 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 internally, the activities are, uh, uh, are conducted uh, with internal orientation and the organization is quite rigid in terms of responding to, uh, to, to, to changes. Also look at uh, knowledge uh, management before we, we finish today. Now, to any uh, uh, digital uh, enterprise or any business that uh, employs digital technologies, to such organization, knowledge is a key uh, resource. And because of that, we need to have uh, uh, tools and techniques that will be used for acquiring, uh, uh, developing knowledge, storing knowledge, and disseminating uh, knowledge. Because this is a key resource that your business uh, will require. You need to have uh, 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 knowledge in order to know uh, uh, value creating uh, processes, how to interact with your suppliers, your intermediaries, your customers, and so on. So it's very important that you continuously accumulate uh, knowledge. That's why when we uh, talked about the balanced scorecard, uh, we, we talked about, uh, uh, among other things, your plans for learning and growth. How are you accumulating uh, knowledge uh, in your organization? Now, there are two types of uh, knowledge. The first one is explicit knowledge, and that is uh, knowledge that can be uh, readily or easily documented. So, for instance, uh, how we perform certain procedures within an organization, certain processes. These are things that we can document in manuals and everyone can be given this uh, information. So even new employees can be provided with this uh, information. But you have another type of knowledge that is tacit knowledge. This is the knowledge that resides in the minds of your employees. It's not documented anywhere. The only way you can share this type of knowledge is through, uh, say, histories, inter interaction between employees, uh, rotation of employees. So th this is the kind of uh, knowledge that is m much needed, but it's difficult uh, uh, to capture because it's mostly uh, in the minds of your employees. Now, objective or the goal of most uh, organizations is to transform this tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge. That instead of people having uh, knowledge about how to do uh, things, for instance, how to, uh, to, to react in a situation uh, that involves uh, multiple variables, which is, is not documented anywhere. We want to tra translate this knowledge into explicit knowledge, knowledge that we, we can document and everyone can see. And this is important in, in uh, ensuring sustainability of an organization because we don't want that when certain employees leave an organization, then certain processes collapse because we don't know exactly what they were doing. So you have to aim at that. Always strive to translate tacit knowledge into explicit uh, knowledge. And this is a, a, an approach or a framework that you can, uh, you can follow. First, in order to, uh, to, to know whether uh, this has to be translated, uh, tacit knowledge has to be translated into explicit knowledge, you have to identify that, that knowledge. And that is done by knowledge benchmarking. Assess the knowledge that you have in your organization and determine the gaps that have to be uh, filled. And then second is, step is to create that knowledge. So when you identify that you are lacking certain knowledge that is necessary for your organization, so you want to create that knowledge. It could be uh, through training, it could be uh, by acquiring services of consultants uh, outside your organization, and so on. And then after knowledge has been created, you want to store that knowledge so that uh, we can share to all the employees within uh, organizations, say through uh, workshops and training programs. And eventually, because we have invested a, a lot in all these stages, that knowledge has to be used. And that completes uh, the cycle of uh, knowledge uh, management framework. And these are some of the uh, popular technologies that you, you can consider when it comes to knowledge uh, management. This technology uh, can be divided into six classes from transactional uh, uh, 
uh, class of knowledge uh, uh, management ap application. Uh, with these uh, uh, applications, the, the, the goal is mostly uh, to facilitate knowledge that facilitate transactions within a, a, an organization. But also you have uh, uh, other applications such as uh, uh, analytical uh, class of knowledge management, where mostly we have uh, data warehousing and data mining uh, tools for customer relationship management applications, for example. And then you have uh, asset management, where in this case, it's mostly uh, tools for document and content management. And then you have a uh, process support, so you have tools uh, that uh, can manage uh, uh, knowledge management for the entire uh, uh, process uh, management. You also have tools for development, that is uh, applications for enhancing staff skills and competencies. And then you have uh, tools for innovation and creation. I'll, I'll show you uh, an example uh, in a couple of uh, seconds. So, so if you go to, to this link, you have uh, examples of numerous uh, tools uh, or software programs that can help you uh, to implement knowledge management in your organization. There are hundreds of them, and each one of them has uh, its own uh, relevance. So you can visit and uh, look at these options. Finally, and that is the, the last uh, part that we need to look at is the risk management. That no, whenever you are introducing changes to your organization, there will be change, uh, potential risk. That is problems that are likely to happen. Not everything will go as planned. So as such, you need to identify what uh, potential risk your organization is likely to face by adapting uh, the new uh, technological solutions. And if you identify these problems, then try to find the uh, possible solutions, how you can encounter uh, these uh, problems. And then implement the solutions, especially starting with those that are, are likely to have higher impact, and then monitor the risk to learn for future risk assessment. So here are the uh, steps. So you need to identify different risks that are associated with introducing digital uh, technologies and assign weight that for each of these uh, problems. So for instance, uh, there is a problem that the, the senior management may not be committed to this change or uh, there will be high staff turnover and so on. So for each of these, you can assign a probability. Now you, you, you will tell me that probability usually ranges from zero to, to one, but in this case, it's assigning uh, weight. So we are assigning weight from zero to 10 of how likely uh, uh, this risk can happen. So if you, you want, you can consider that as 0 0.5, but it's just a scale. And then assess the impact. If this problem happens, how significant the impact will be from zero to 10. And then provide potential solution to each of the problems that are likely to happen as a result of implementing uh, the new digital solutions. And that's it for today.